This lab is called Identifying Carbohydrates. So um, I want to introduce some of the carbohydrates and the stains that we're going to be using to test those carbohydrates. If you from, remember from lecture, we went over three different types of, of carbohydrates. A very small one, one that's slightly larger, and a really large one. The one that's really small is called a monosaccharide, mono meaning one. So remember, a sugar is shaped like a hexagon, most of them, either a hexagon or a pentagon. And this is a representation of just one of those sugars. An example of a monosaccharide would be glucose. Another example of a monosaccharide is fructose. They are single sugars. If you take glucose and fructose and you put them together with a bond, you have now created a disaccharide. Saccharides, again, means sugar. So you have a monosaccharide, single sugar, disaccharide, two sugars. This is your common table sugar, and that's called sucrose. If you extend a lot of these um, glucoses together and put them together into a large chain like this, you now have a polysaccharide. Instead of it being linear, we're not looking at cellulose, this is lightly branched. If you remember from lecture, we were talking about two different types of branched molecules. This is a plant molecule, starch, and it is lightly branched and it's used as their energy storage. And we can also use it for, um, for us because we can eat the starch and then obtain its energy and then that will then be stored as glycogen in our body. But we're not testing for glycogen today, we're just testing for um, polysaccharides. The two stains that we're gonna be using are gonna be over here, and the first one is a blue stain, and it is called Benedict's Solution. And this one tests specifically for monosaccharides. We're also gonna be testing for um, polysaccharides using the starch as well. So I'm gonna take this little figure for the blue stain, and you can kind of figure out which of these is the Benedict's going to bind onto? It'll bind onto monosaccharides because with chemicals, their structure determines their activity. Very much like we learned how the um, structure of a, of a stain determines its color. Very, very similarly, this molecule has a very particular shape and it can only bind onto monosaccharides such as glucose. Can it bind onto disaccharides? No, it can't really because it just, the shape is not appropriate for that fit. Can it bind onto polysaccharides? And the answer is no, it just can't, can't do that. So this is the Benedict solution and we're gonna be testing for monosaccharides with that. Now, with the um, iodine, the iodine is this orange or golden stain you'll see. Does this bind onto monosaccharides? Well, it doesn't actually. Does it bind onto, onto disaccharides? And it doesn't. Does it bind onto polysaccharides? It actually does bind onto polysaccharides, and it's, again, because the shape of the stain determines how it binds onto the bonds of these polysaccharides. So that's what we're going to be testing for, and I don't believe you have the instructions for this, so I want to share with you the setup of everything. So I have a test tube rack, and I have eight test tubes, and we're going to be putting in our, our samples in just a few minutes. I also have a hot plate. This is heating some water because I need this to help the reaction take place for the Benedict's or that blue, blue stain. So what I'd like you to do is to pull this sheet out, which you do have, and I'd like you to fill in this column right here with the molecule present. So, and I'd like you to fill in the molecule as we go over um, each of these test tubes. So the instructions say that um, in test tube one, I'm gonna squeeze two pipettes of glucose solution. So here is my test tube rack. And I'm going to be putting glucose, I'm going to be putting two pipettes into test tube number one. One and two. And again, right now, you should be filling in your chart right here. The molecule present in test tube number one is glucose. In test tube number two, we're going to be squeezing two pipettes of sucrose. So here's the sucrose solution. We have one and we have two. In test tube number three, it says to squeeze two pipettes of the starch solution. So here's the starch. One. And two. And something very interesting is going to be occurring in test tube number four. This says squeeze one test tube of starch. Okay. One test tube of starch. And it also says or one pipette of starch. It also says add the same volume of saliva. 
So you'll see in this over here, in this test tube, I've collected some, collected some spit over the past half an hour. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be adding one pipette of that into this test tube with the starch. And I'm going to swirl this a little bit. Now what's interesting is that we have 100% starch in this one. And here we have some starch in some of my spit. Inside your saliva, there is an enzyme and the enzyme actually begins digestion of your starch. So remember, your starch is a polysaccharide. It's this long chain molecule. You try to find an end. And your saliva are like enzymes, and enzymes are like scissors. The enzymes are gonna come up to this molecule and they're gonna start to chop it up into individual sugar molecules. This is actually something you might be able to do. If you have any saltine crackers at home or any plain crackers at home, try putting them in your mouth you can actually do this. Put them in your mouth and add some saliva to it and chew it up a little bit and then let it sit for about five to ten minutes inside your mouth. Over time, what's going to be happening is the saliva with the enzyme is going to be chopping up the starch that's inside the cracker and it's going to be creating these things. Well, what are these things? These are monosaccharides. These are actually glucose. So what's going to be happening to that cracker solution inside of your mouth? it should start to become sweet because you're creating glucoses. Remember that this large molecule can't fit inside your taste buds, but this small molecule of glucose can, and this is what triggers the receptors inside your tongue to trigger your brain to sense that you're tasting something that is sweet. So that's what's happening, and that, hopefully that's what's happening currently in the test tube number four that we're gonna be um, um, looking at in a few minutes. So, we now need to add 10 drops of my blue Benedict solution. So I'm gonna add 10 drops to each of these test tubes. So here I have, I have glucose, here I have sucrose, here I have starch, and here I have starch and saliva. So I'm gonna put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay? So I've added my Benedict's, my blue stain. Okay? This is again this right here. So which of these should we expect a color change in? Well, let me put this to the side here. Well, this remember is going to react with the monosaccharides, so we should expect a color change in number one because that contains glucose. We should not expect a color change with two because the Benedict solution only binds onto monosaccharides. And the third one is pure starch. Okay, this one does not have a place to bind on with pure starch. However, the fourth test tube has had the saliva with the enzyme that act as scissors, and it's gonna be chopping up the starch into individual monomers, monosaccharides, of glucose. What should we be seeing here? We should be seeing also a reaction in test tube number four. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take test tubes numbers one through four, and I'm going to put them over into the test tube here. I'm gonna to try to keep track of them. I haven't labeled them. One, two, three, and four. So we'll let those sit and we'll come back um, in about 10 minutes after we finish this next part for um, our other test, which we're now gonna be testing for polysaccharides. So in test tube number five, we are going to have two pipettes of water Okay, there is no polysaccharide in there. One, two. Why are we doing water? I just want to show you what it looks like to have a control with just water. Okay, in test number six, so make sure on your chart you're filling it in. Six, or number five should say water. Six should say starch solution. Okay, so I'm going to add some starch to number six. One. Okay, two. Test tube number seven is going to have 
some starch, but also saliva. I'm going to be adding some starch. There's my starch. Here's my saliva. Here's my spit. Going in test tube number seven. Okay, I'm going to stir that up a little bit to get my spit to start activating on those molecules. I could do the same thing. This is sort of like the cracker experiment. Now I have starch in here and I have my spit. So um, over time, what's going to be happening is more of the monomers, the monosaccharides of glucose, are going to be created from the starch over here. So this should become sweet. So if I drank this, it would be a little bit slightly sweet. And in test tube number eight, we have glucose. Okay, one and two. Okay, so this is going to give us some instant results for this. So here's my water. I'm going to be testing this with the, with the iodine, and I'm going to put 10 drops of iodine in the water. Well, what should happen? Well, the stain is looking for a polysaccharide, and there is no polysaccharide in the water. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, this is giving us this golden orange color, and this actually is a negative result. This is just water. Okay, in test tube number six, okay, what you should also record in your chart is that this is an orange color, or you can also say gold. So the initial stain color. For the iodine, for 5, 6, 7, and 8, it's actually, the iodine itself is a golden color. So it's gold, 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 and gold. The Benedict says blue, 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 and blue. So we're going to see what colors they become. So number 5, it started off orange or gold and ended up orange or gold. So now, here is the starch in this one. Okay, remember, starch is a polysaccharide. We should be expecting to see different results for this when I put 10 drops of iodine in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Is there a difference? There is a difference. So this is the classic starch and um, iodine reaction that it's going to turn this into a, a blue or a black or a purplish color. It looks like it's quite black, actually. So... Um, that is that test tube there. Now I'm going to test this last one here as well, and this is going to be the uh, glucose. This is a monosaccharide. Again, this does not bind onto monosaccharides. Okay, you need a polysaccharide in order to have binding. So let's see what happens with this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm going to stir this one up a little bit. And this one should look very much similar to the water. In the water, there's nothing for the stain to bind onto. But even with the glucose, there's nothing for the stain to bind onto. We'll come back to this one in a minute. I just want to make sure that we're heating up my samples um, enough. And I'm starting to see some um, results and some color changes. Let me go ahead and pan over here and you can see. In the first one, we're starting to see a, a color change. And also, in the last one, we're starting to see some color um, change as well. So we'll come back to that. And hopefully this is allowed enough time for us to see a result for this one right here. So again, this one had the starch, but it also had my saliva, which started chopping these up into smaller pieces. Even though this is not inside my body, these enzymes are still active, and they can activate, or they can act on the starch molecules by chopping them up into glucoses. So what should this look like when I add the 10, 10 drops? Well, the longer I let this sit, <clears throat> the more um, active. So um, I'm actually decided I'm going to come back to this one uh, a little bit later, and we're going to get the results from the first experiment over here. So I'm going to pull these out, and I'm going to put them back in order. Here's test tube number one. Here's test tube number two. Here's test tube three. And here's test tube number four. Okay, so 
Now, we're not seeing the bright coloration that we usually see with this, but we didn't have enough time for this to actually react because I just want to make this a little bit shorter. So if you remember, in test tube number one, we had glucose. Okay, it went from blue to this color right here. These oftentimes will convert into an orange or a red coloration or even a brown coloration. Now, test tube number two, this had sucrose in it, which was a disaccharide. Again, the disaccharide doesn't have anything to bind onto, so we would not expect that. Okay? Number three was starch. Well, this doesn't bind onto starch um, either. However, we start to see a color change with this one. This one had starch in it, but if you remember, it also had my spit. And it was creating these monosaccharides, just like the monosaccharides of glucose that we see in test tube number one. So over time, this is going to start off blue, and then over time, it's going to look more and more and more like test tube number one, as more and more of the starch gets cut up. Eventually, what would you expect would happen to this really long chain? If you give enough time, the enzymes would continue to chop them up into smaller and smaller pieces, and eventually, you would have no polysaccharide, and it would be 100% monosaccharide. And so, you would get lots of staining, um, into this new color, and you would lose all the blue coloration. So let's go to this last one, which is test tube 7. So just like this test tube right here, where the starch and spit have been combined together, here we were testing for the monosaccharide. We see monosaccharide present. Well, now we're going to be testing to see how much of the polysaccharide is left. Let's go ahead and we're going to be adding 10 drops here. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, we got ten drops in there. Okay, so if this was 100% starch, we would expect it to look like this. Well, it looks like there might be a little bit of starch left, but look, this is looking very much like this, which is glucose. So, this is the glucose here, this is the starch with the spit. So within just a few minutes, it seemed that the majority of my starch, which should look like this, ended up being chopped up into monomers of glucose, and it looks like test tube number eight.